I told you recently about a case involving FCC agents hunting down illegal CB operators in the United States, and today we'll be looking at a case closer to home involving a breaker known as Blue Shark. Blue Shark's experience of the British judicial system left him financially worse off and with a poor opinion of it after a case involving what seemed like a personal vendetta by the police. The saga began in July 1981 when Blue Shark and two friends were parked in a car park on the cliffs at Brighton. Blue Shark had a rig connected in the car. The car was approached by a couple who identified themselves as police officers and demanded access to the car although they weren't in uniform or on duty and were in a private car. They informed Blue Shark that they suspected there was a CB in the vehicle but he refused to let them into the car. The officers threatened to smash the windows of the car to gain entry and radioed for further assistance. Blue Shark, alarmed by the threats, agreed to give up the rig as long as the make and model were recorded and the uniform officer who arrived to help agreed to do so. The police made a visual inspection of the set and passed it back to Blue Shark. They then demanded entry to the car again and threatened once more to smash the windows. Blue Shark, knowing when he was beaten, let them look. They found another set along with some boots, which were slang for amplifiers, and they wanted to confiscate them along with the rig they'd originally given back. This caused an argument, and getting angry at the whole affair, Blue Shark picked up the first rig and threw it over the cliffs, and was quickly arrested for obstructing the police officer in the course of his duty. Blue Shark was taken to the local police station, searched, questioned and locked up. Eventually released an hour and a half later, he was bailed to reappear at the police station a month after. On presenting himself back at the station, he was told that there was no charges to be made. He got all the confiscated accessories back, his SWR meter, boots and antenna, and was told by the police that they didn't want to get involved. He didn't, however, get the other rig back. He got the impression that the two officers concerned had a personal crusade against CB and that they'd monitored the channels to collect information. Six weeks later, he contacted the post office to see what the situation was. They confirmed that they'd held the seized rig and that although it was illegal, they weren't intending to prosecute. A month later, Blue Shark's solicitor wrote for clarification of the acts that the police had detained the items under. He received a reply from the Customs and Excise Department requesting an interview with Blue Shark. At the interview, he refused to give any information other than his name, address and age, and he wouldn't answer any questions concerning where he got the rig or who from. Customs and Excise said that they weren't interested in prosecuting and served him with an official seizure notice. Since he felt he'd escaped lightly, he decided not to fight the loss of his rig. Some months later, however, he received a recorded letter summonsing him to a court appearance at the local magistrates. Unfortunately, the letter hadn't been delivered until after the date of the case. In fact, the court hearing was only five days after the date of the letter, giving hardly any time to consult legal advice. In his absence, Blue Shark was found guilty of offences against the Wireless Telegraphy Act and fined £200 and £75 in costs. Police evidence was the only information given in court. Blue Shark immediately made a sworn declaration to a justice of the peace that he'd not received the summons until after the case and lodged a complaint. The court proceedings were declared null and void and Blue Shark was served with another summons for the same offences, this time in person by the local CID. This one only gave him eight days to prepare his case, so Blue Shark's solicitor appeared in his place to ask for an adjournment. Blue Shark was granted a further six weeks. Because of problems with obtaining an experienced barrister and correct advice, three solicitors later, Blue Shark asked for and got a further adjournment. The case finally came to court 13 months after the event. Unfortunately, by this time, Blue Shark's financial resources were running thin, so he was forced to plead guilty, although police evidence was very circumstantial. The Home Office prosecutor was unfamiliar with this subject and went on at length about interference problems in general. Blue Shark was given every opportunity to state his case and explain his actions. The magistrates were impressed that in the intervening time, Blue Shark had studied for and passed the amateur radio exam. 
Blue Shark emphasised that although he had to plead guilty and understood the nature of the offence, he didn't feel that he'd acted like a criminal and produced evidence of positive things that CB could achieve. The magistrates were obviously rather bemused by the technical aspects of the case, as was the prosecutor as he constantly referred to his notes and said, I am instructed when faced with something he didn't really understand. Blue Shark was fined £100 and £50 cost. He was disappointed that he hadn't been able to fight the case as he'd wished, although local clubs had offered to help raise funds if necessary. But why did the case ever come to court when the parties involved weren't interested in prosecuting? The police evidence rested on two off-duty officers who may have had a personal campaign against CBers. They maintained that they observed Blue Shark talking into a microphone, but from a distance of 20 yards in complete darkness when his car was parked between two other cars. Was the decision to prosecute then taken further up the ladder when it was realised that Blue Shark was a very prominent local breaker who had helped form a local club, had organised demonstrations to London to support CB and an active campaigner? We'll probably never know. That's a pretty good uh, invitation there. Uh, mm. I shall look forward to that immensely. Um, so tell me, you haven't worn a grouch show out then with a handle like that? I would have thought you'd have worn him out. Come back. Yeah, but uh, we've only just started. You can say it's obligatory, yeah? This is only the first slide it's been all right yet. Yeah, Roddy D, uh, hold on a sec, lady Blake. I think there's someone trying to climb over me to get you. Uh, Blake on the side, if you're trying to get the info, bring it on back. No, uh, the break has stepped down. Uh, he's got cold feet. I don't think he can handle it either. Uh, must be one of those turkey, uh, turkey other breakers. Anyway, uh, nympho.